morning, Hope Community. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. My name is Jamie. I'm a volunteer here at Hope Community. Um, I've just got a few announcements as we get started today. So uh, when you came in the door, you should have received a program. It should look like this. Um, if you did not get one, would you raise your hand and we'll have some people bring one to you? Excellent. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, this program is going to tell you all the things that are happening in our church. So any announcements that we have, any activities that are coming up, um, this is your go-to source. Um, so at the bottom of the program, it's perforated. So you can just fold it over like this and you can tear it right off. This is um, our connection card. So the information you put on here, put as much as you feel comfortable filling out. We'd love to keep in touch with you and let you know what's going on. And um, as you turn it in, um, we have a gift for you. So you'll go back to that welcome table or you can put it in the blue box, whichever you're comfortable with. But if you stop by that welcome table and see Miss Barb, we have a devotional book for you and we have the world's best lip balm. <laughs> All right. So um, stop by there and grab that if you would. Um, let's see. Make sure I don't miss anything. Okay. So uh, if you are a first time guest, we would love to connect with you and give you a free gift, which I just showed you. Um, just make sure you fill out as much as you're comfortable with on the connection card. And at the end of the service, that's when we'll collect those for you at the welcome table. And uh, if you check in on Facebook, for each check-in, Hope Community Church will donate $1 to Kids Central. Um, we have more information about Kids Central on your program. Um, let me see what else I have to tell you today. <laughs> All right. Um, our giving. You can give to the church by texting this number, 352-444-1771, or putting offering in the blue box, which is located next to the door on your way out. Um, we have an upcoming event. Our second annual uh, Christmas with Hope event is coming up. Uh, it's going to be outside of the church building here on Saturday, December 4th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We need volunteers. And we have sign-ups back here at the welcome table. There are tons of different little things that you could help with. Um, from, um, from helping set up, tear down, to running games, to giving out food some way you can help so um also let's see what am i missing we're accepting gift donations for children of all ages for this event um, we don't want a child to come here without some type of gift so if you can think about it um, we're going to place these unwrapped gifts in the donation box at the back of the church there um, they're nice and decorated um, so you can't miss them there uh, what else we are looking for volunteers to help wrap these gifts on wednesday december 1st at first at 6 p.m here at the church and we're going to do a, a wrapping party um, and if you would like to participate in that, you can uh, contact Leanne Gassaway. Um, if you're available to help with donating and or wrapping gifts for this event, you can contact Leanne. More information is here in your program. Uh, if you'd like to make a financial contribution to support the Christmas with Hope event, uh, write Christmas with Hope in the memo of your check. Or you can give online and select Christmas with Hope in the drop-down menu there. Um, we hope you find the service relevant today. We're so glad that you're here. Um, just worship with us. Thank you. Let's stand together. This is Amazing Grace.
reach out for that name this morning. Jesus. Jesus, your name is power. Zeph's going to come this morning. Just stay in an attitude of worship. Hallelujah. As we go to prayer, you may be seated. Or those, if you choose to stand, that's you're welcome to do so. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he is the King of Kings. And he now sits at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for us. And we need to give him praise and thanks today. Thank you, worship team, for, for leading us in uh, the spirit of worship. And as we go to prayer today, we always like to pray for a different ministry in the area. And today, um, we would like to, to pray for House of Hope. Uh, some of the guys are here this morning. Uh, let's pray for that ministry. Let's pray for the men who are trying to get back on track with their lives. And, and uh, so let's ask God to watch over that ministry and, and also Pastor Malcolm, who is uh, the leader. Let's uh, pray and trust God for that. Let's go to pray. And as we pray today, take a moment to, to pray for those that you know, maybe as a friend, as a neighbor, someone who asks you to pray, someone that you know who is sick and not well, Take a moment to pray for those people today. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your goodness and your mercies. We thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you, O oh God, that you so loved us that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to, to die for our sins. He gave his life. He shed his blood because he wants us to be free from sin and thank you thank you that we have that freedom we are free today through that blood and through the sacrifice give us the grace and the strength that we will continue to to live for you every single day help us to keep our eyes upon you lord because you are the author and the finisher of our faith we thank you and we praise you for all the needs that are being represented here just now by each and every individual. We lift them all before you and pray that you will touch them in a very special way. We speak favor. We especially ask, O oh God, that you would watch over Ronnie's dad today, uh, which is a touch-and-go situation right now, and we commit that to you. We thank you and we praise you. And for all others that need a special touch today, we speak favor on their behalf. Watch over House of Hope. Thank you, God, for this ministry. I pray that you would watch over Pastor Malcolm and uh, watch over his leadership. Be with the guys as they try to get back on track with their lives. And we thank you and we praise you. 
and help them to realize that there is nothing impossible for God to do. We give you praise. Be with Pastor Don as he would come and share the word. And Lord, I pray that the word that he speaks today would be a source of encouragement and strength to all of us. Blessing our tithes and offering as we are being faithful stewards to you. Use it to build your kingdom. And we shall give you all the praise and thanks. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. If you're going to Children's Church or Kids Zone, that would be the time to do this. <coughs> So Dr. Philip Riken, uh, president of Wheaton College, in his book called uh, Courage to Stand, he gave an assessment of Christianity in America. And he says this. He says, many people still go to church, but it hardly matters to them or anyone else. They're still Christians, of course, but religion has been excluded from the public square. The 21st century thus dawns a post-Christian America. Um, he actually wrote this years ago. Is he overstating his case? I don't think so. Uh, watch any show this afternoon, this, this evening. Watch any sporting event and ask yourself, does the teachings of Jesus, do those appear to be the predominant influence in our culture? And then watch the non-Christian stations, and it's even worse. Um, <laughs> Allow me, to highly, allow me to highly suggest that our problem as the church is not that we live in a post-Christian culture. I want to suggest that our problem is we have post-Christian churches. It's sort of like a, a, a boat. A boat is meant to be in the water. The problem is, is when you have too much water in the boat. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's, that's where we're at. And so Riken goes on to ask this question. How does the Christian, or let me just rephrase this because I'm not sure what Christian means anymore. But how does the follower of Christ live for Christ in a post-Christian culture? So let me, let me quickly define culture because we, we talk about culture a lot, but we never really define it. And let, let me just say on simple terms or surface level, culture is the way we do things here, all right? Or that's the way they do things over there. That's, that's their culture. Um, but underneath that surface, there's, there's core values, right? There's our history. There's our, there's, there's our experience. There's our, our beliefs that we hold maybe even sacred. And Ed, Edgar Schrein says this. He says, think of culture like a lily pad like a lily pad pond. You go out there and you look at that and you can see on the, the surface, you, you can see some flowers, you see lily pads. That's all visible. And you can look at that and go, okay, that's the way we do things here. That's, that's the visible culture. He says, but, but underneath, um, there, there, there's, you find explanations. Like, like what's, what's the root system? Why were these plants chosen in the first place? What? Um, you know, how, how is this fed? What, what, is, what is feeding it? What's the history behind this? And, and that's kind of the under, underpinnings of, of the culture. So we are in a sermon series called What If? And I stole this idea from Marvel Comics TV series. Most of you said you like them. Um, they have this TV series called What If? Where they explore these, these um, various alternative timelines where, where like one thing changes in the story and it has dramatic consequences and world-changing events um, to, to the rest of the story. And so what, what we're exploring, jumping off of that idea, is Jesus' invitation to enter in or be grounded in a better story, to be grounded in the gospel story, um, to, to be a different culture, if we want to jump off of what we're talking about here. And so let me ask a question that, that I want to answer today. In our post-Christian world, what if we lived as strangers and aliens? What if we lived as strangers and aliens in a post-Christian world? Uh, I didn't come up with the idea of strangers and, and uh, aliens or exiles. Um, 
the authors of the Bible did. Uh, Peter, Peter wrote to a pre-Christian world, and this is what he wrote. Uh, 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Beloved, that, that's you, church, beloved. He says, I urge you to live as sojourners. What's a sojourner? That's somebody that's traveling through. That's a, that's a foreigner. That's a, a stranger and exiles. In, in other words, he's saying, for those of you who your kingdom is actually somewhere else, Church, your, your kingdom is, is, is somewhere else. You answer to a different authority. He says, I want you to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. So I know, I know a lot of people, they, they hear this and they go, okay, this means what happens here isn't really important and I'm just here temporarily. I'm just passing through. And, and that's kind of a shame because that's not what this passage is saying. This passage is saying a whole lot more, um, and we're going to develop that. Peter continues with this. He says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles, and don't think of ethnic Gentiles. Think of people that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He says, keep your conduct among those people honorable, so that when they speak against you, he doesn't say if they speak against you, he says when they speak against you, you, when they speak against you as evil deal doers, they may see your good works and glorify God in the day of salvation. So there's an evangelistic outcome to this. In other words, live, live as strangers and aliens, live a, a totally different way than the culture. So even though they say negative things about you, eventually some of those people are going to glorify God. Some of those people are going to come to know Jesus Christ because how you and I live. And this morning, I want to look at four individuals in the book of Daniel. And if, and if you're looking for the book of Daniel, it's a little bit over three quarters of the way through the Bible, about an eighth, eighth of an inch from the New Testament, um, if, you, if you're going through there. And there are four individuals in the book of Daniel who embody what it looks like to live as, as strangers and exiles for the glory of God in a culture that is far from God. These guys, are, these guys are my heroes here. Let me give you a little bit of background before we just jump in the book. Um, so Daniel, he was born, um, he was, his, da Daniel was born in an extremely turbulent time in which Israel uh, was divided into two kingdoms. You got the kingdom of Israel, got the kingdom of Judah. And then in 605 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar and his army, they invade Judah. They took some of the royals, the, the noble uh, captive. And then by 586 BC, the collapse is complete. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar returns to Jerusalem, does some really wonderful things here. He burns the temple. He broke down the city walls. He took all but the poorest of the Jewish people captive to Babylon. And in the midst... That, that, that's pretty rough, right? I mean, you're like, man, 2020 was bad. This is pretty bad, okay? This, this is bad stuff. The, the temple is burned, all right? And in the middle of these terrible circumstances, there's, there's four guys that just rise to the top, and they are teenage boys. Four teenage boys rise to the top, and, and you'll, I mean, these guys are unshakable in their faith. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they show us how to live as strangers and aliens. So if, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Daniel chapter 1, about three quarters of the way through. If you're at Ezekiel, keep flipping and you'll get to Daniel. And it's going to be up here on the screen. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave, uh, that's very interesting. It says the Lord gave. So like God's not like, oh no, what am I going to do? It says the Lord gave Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, little g, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God, again, little g. The king commanded... Espinaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youth without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, 
and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and the wine that he drank, and they were educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah from the tribe of Judah, and the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah, he called Shadrach, Mishael, he called Meshach, and Azariah, he called Abednego. Fun to read. Let me give you, let me give you, let me give you four practices of, of, of these of these teenagers as, as, as they lived as, as exiles, as, as strangers, as foreigners. First one, they became experts of the culture. They were experts of the culture. For, for three years, these four teenagers, they, they were taught literature. They were taught the language. They were taught the, the, the culture. They, they actually dug deep. They saw what, what was underneath the surface. Now, let's just be fair to, to these guys. They didn't seek this out. They didn't say, hey, I think we want to learn the culture here. Uh, we'll, we'll just call this divine intervention and cross-cultural training. Um, in other words, God's like, hey, I got a plan for you. You're going you're gonna to do some uh, cross-cultural training here. But by the end of the three years, I could imagine that these guys probably knew the, whole, the history and the culture of the Babylonians better than the Babylonians. They, they, they understood what, what made these, these people tick. And I think if we as Christians, if we want to take the Great Commission seriously, we're going to need to understand, we're going to need to become students of, of the culture that is around us. And when I say that, I mean the culture that we embrace and the culture that, that we reject. Sometimes we embrace culture because it, it works for us. Um, but, but I think we need, to be, we need to be students of that. And if you're looking for your divine appointment for that, Jesus already gave that. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. That, that word nation is ethnos, which we get the word ethnicity, or we could say people groups. So Jesus is saying, I want you to go out and make disciples of all people groups. And, and I, think, I think we can look at that and say, okay, what are the people groups? That, that could include race, that can include uh, gender, uh, generations, people from different geo, social, political ideologies. That, that Jesus is saying, all those people, the ones you like, the ones you don't like, I want you to go out and make disciples of all of those. And if the church is going to live up to her missiological identity, in other words, being on mission for God, we're going to need to engage the culture that we're trying to reach. We, we're going to need to under, understand that culture. And I think sometimes uh, we, we fear. We fear like, okay, if, if we study the culture, if we, if we look at this, we're going to become just like the culture. And I want to suggest the opposite is true. What you don't evaluate, you're going to assimilate. All right? So, so we need to look at that culture. We, we need to evaluate that culture and say, okay, why do we do the things that we do? Otherwise, you're going to assimilate that. And so how do, you, how do you live in that broken culture and not become assimilated to it? Well, Daniel and his friends, I think they had a deep understanding of, of who God is and, and, and who they were and the story that they belonged to. Sometimes we forget that story. Uh, so as they're surrounded by others, imagine that. There's these four teenage boys, and they're, they're being trained. They're surrounded by others that are eating the finest cuts of pork, and, and they're washing it down with the king's best Chardonnay. Here's, here's the second thing they did. They resolved to not be controlled by the diet of the culture. They resolved to not be controlled by the diet of the culture. Uh, Daniel 1 verse 8, it says, But D Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs, to allow him to not defile himself. So, a little quick Jewish history here. They had this strict diet on the food uh, that, that they could eat and not eat. And Daniel's going to approach this official, and the official's kind of worried, like, okay, if, if, I, if I change up your diet and, and, and you're not as healthy, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. 
I don't know if you've met the king. He's kind of a bully. He, he kills people. Um, and so, so Daniel just, you know, Daniel's going to say, let's make a deal. Let's just try this out for 10 days and, and you check and see how we're doing. If it doesn't work, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try something else here. So Daniel 1.15 says this. It says, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh. By the way, that, that's kind of like, a, like an idiom. There's a cultural thing there. That fatter in the flesh, some translations say they were healthier. Um, and, and so, like, in our culture, like, I'm not an expert on the culture, but if, if your wife is, is eating healthier and she's looking better, tell her she's looking healthy. Don't tell her she's looking fatter in the flesh. Just, just my cultural understanding, all right? All right. So, so yes, yes. That's free, by the way. Uh, so their appearance... And they, they, were, they were healthier than all the youth that ate at the king's table. So the steward took away their food and, and wine that they drank and gave them only vegetables. So notice what Daniel did here. He didn't demand anything, right? He, he, he didn't even belittle like, oh, you guys, your stupid diet and blah, blah, blah. Um, he, he lived as a stranger and as, as, as an exile. And so he asked for an opportunity. He says, can I just give you an opportunity to show you that the way our God has told us to live, it works, and, and it works well. Um, could you imagine if we understood our own culture um, around us that is sometimes, well, let's see if I'll overstate this or not, sometimes materialistic, sometimes self-centered, consumption-minded. Could, could you imagine what we could do as a church if we would deal with our own cultural assimilation, how, how have we become more like the culture than, than, than the gospel or the kingdom of Jesus and, and where we have compromised the gospel and we, and we deal with that? And then in a non-judgmental way, we would go out and say, okay, as a church with a different culture, what if we demonstrated a better way? And, and you've heard me say this before, the gospel is an invitation to a better story. We, we were all living a certain story. We were following certain things. And, and Jesus steps in and says, I have a better story for you. I have a much better story and a, a much better ending than what you were going to go through. Now, let's make sure every, that we don't think, well, you know, everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows when that happens. Um, this doesn't mean you're not going to tick people off. Because I, I, I just imagine, maybe I'm wrong, I'm just imagining some of Daniel's and Shadrach, Meshach's friends, you know, going, um, hey, we were enjoying the king's food. We were enjoying, I mean, that was some good Chardonnay there. And, and we got broccoli and water tonight, bro. What's, what's you know, what's going on here? And, and, and there's some at play here. Daniel didn't force that on anybody. You, you notice that he does, doesn't force his, his beliefs on anybody. He, he believes them deeply, and he thinks they're the way to live. But, but you know who forced the beliefs? The, 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 pa the pagan official, the king. The, the, the king. That, that, that's all he knows how to rule. He's like, hey, you're going to do what I say? All right, chop your head off. And they, oh, okay. Let's do what this guy says. Um, I think there's something that the king doesn't understand. And sometimes we can forget that as the church, that coerced conversion is not really conversion, right? We, it, 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 it's only like a surface level change. It's, it's kind of like you go in the pond and you go, well, let's just clip this out. Let's clip this out. Let's, let's put this here. But, but we're not dealing with the root system. And, 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 and what grows up is, is because of the root system. They, followed, they follow because the king has a sword. That, that's, why they, that's why they do this. And, and it, it's amazing how, how respectful these guys are in a very hostile, uh, a very polarized situation here where they strongly disagreed morally and theologically and, and, and politically with, with the Babylonians. And I think that's what Peter is saying. I want you to live as strangers and exiles. I want you to live in, in, in such a way that, that you make a difference for the kingdom of God. You know, and I, 
And I wonder how many times, when's the last time where you experience people that have extreme disagreements, but have this level of, of respect? Let me put it this way. When's the last time that, that you demonstrated that level of respect? Because we can all, we, anybody here have anybody that's disrespected you lately? Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so we all have those stories, but, but where is it where, where we could step in in a hostile environment, live, live what we believe, and, and show this kind of respect that, that Daniel and his friends did? Here, here's the third thing they did. They gave ultimate honor and allegiance to God. You know, they're not just, you know, living like, hey, you know, whatever, it's cool, we're in Babylon, you know, when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians. No, they didn't do that. There was no confusion in their minds of where they lived and who they were. And I think sometimes we, we forget that. We, we, de we define ourselves by, by our, our location and our, our surrounding. And location does not define you. Okay? We are defined by a different kingdom. Daniel and his friends knew that they were part of a different kingdom. Story's going to get good here. King, King Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Ch chapter 2, Daniel interprets some dreams. It, it's kind of weird, like, like he's actually blessing the people that he's amongst. Um, and then chapter 3, uh, Nebuchadnezzar makes an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was 6 cubits. That's a lot of cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. And then everybody was told this, uh, verse 5. And when you hear the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the trigon and the harp and the bagpipe and every kind of music, I don't know why they named them all, but every kind of music, you are to fall down and you are to worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. It's funny, they never tell us what the image is, but I'm guessing it looks a lot like Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so, so they have this golden image. And he says, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. If you don't know the story, can you guess what's going to happen here? Um, there, there are some people that are not going to bow down and worship the, the golden image. Uh, verse 13. So they don't bow down. And then Nebuchadnezzar in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship the golden image that I've set up? And they're like, duh. Uh, verse 15. Now if you're ready, you know, now that you've thought this through... If you're ready, you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that, that I have made well and good. You know, like, hey, I'll forgive everything if you just go ahead and worship right now. But if you don't worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God, little G, that will deliver you? Out of my hands. I, I think he was doing okay to hear. Like he was going to get away with this. And then he kind of invoked something. Like and what God could actually deliver you from me. Yeah we're going to find out. Uh, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king. Look, look how polite these guys are by the way. It says oh Nebuchadnezzar. We have no need to answer you in this matter. In, in other words, you know us. You, you, you've seen how we live. You know our conduct. You know that we're not going to do this. And, and if this be so, if, if this is the reality, this is, this is our choice, worship or, 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 or die, if this be so, our God whom we serve, capital G by the way, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Then they say something kind of fascinating here. But if not, and in and, and other words, he, he might not. Our, our God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. If, if he wants us to roast for his glory, I, you know, that, that's the way 
It's going to be. But it, and if he doesn't, even if our God doesn't deliver us out of this fiery furnace, know this. Be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar, filled with fury, and the expression on his face was changed. I think that's funny. Like Bullies aren't used to being told what to do. So it says, and the expression on his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace to be heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Just a side note here. Don't make decisions when you're furious. Uh, you make stupid mistakes. Um, if, I, I mean, just... Like, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, if you really want to punish these guys, you lower the furnace. You don't, you don't raise it up. Um, and, and, and actually, the, the stupidity of it, if, if you read through the story, his own guards were burnt to death trying to put these guys in. That's because he made the furnace too hot. Um, so I'm not recommending burning people. I'm just saying don't make decisions uh, when, when you're furious. And God at this point, is going to answer what I think Nebuchadnezzar thought was a rhetorical question. Who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Verse 24. And then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not throw three men into the fire? And they answered, these guys are mathematicians, True, O king. Uh, 25, and, he's, and he answered and said, but I see four men unbound. In other words, they, they've been set free. They are unbound, and they are walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Theologians would call this moment a theophany. A theophany is, is where God is manifested uh, to tangible human senses that we can see, we, we, we can hear. Um, and, and others would say that, that this fourth person in the fire is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. And, and, and certainly at a bare minimum, this points to Jesus. This points to Jesus who is our Emmanuel. He is God with us. I, I, I get this sense that... that uh, when Nebuchadnezzar is saying, who will deliver you from my hand? I, I get the sense that there was this gathering of the Godhead and the father looked to the son. He said, you want this one? You got this? And, and, and Jesus says, I'm, I'm on it. And, and, and there's, there's a reminder. Because some of you might be going through a fire right now. You, you might be in the middle of a struggle. And, and, and God's promise isn't always... Um, and, and, and in fact, it's almost never that you're not going to have trials. All right. He, he promises that, that, that you will have trials. But the promise of Jesus Christ is, I will never leave you or, nor forsake you. And in fact, they're thrown in the fire, but God himself shows up and he's in the fire with us. And, and so remind, remind yourself of that, that no matter what you are going through, God's promise is, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He is with you in the fire. Verse 26, it says, And then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door, which, again, not very smart. He raised it up seven times, but um, came near the door of the burning furnace and declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. This is, you see it like kind of a change here, like, hey, what God's going to deliver you? And hey, my friends, servants of the most high God, you know, come on out. He says, come out and come here. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the fire and the satraps and, and, and the perfects and the, and the governor and the king's counselors. They gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over their bod over the bodies of these men. Their hair and their head was not singed. Have you ever, you ever been in a fire? I've, I've, I've been in a structural fire, and I, I could tell you for days later, I could smell that, that, that fire. And, um, but the, the hairs of their head had not been singed. The cloaks were, were not harmed. There was no smell of fire upon them. And Nebuchadnezzar can answer, can answer, answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel, more like his son of God, and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside 
and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than to serve and worship any god except for their own god. You see what he's doing? I mean, I mean, he's got this whole audience and he's going, guys, these guys are the dudes. These are the people. I told them, if you do this, you're dead. And they set that aside. And they, they actually worshiped and they stayed faithful to the one true God. Now, he, he, he doesn't quite get this. He's still a bully ruler. Uh, verse 29, it says, Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn from limb to limb, and their houses laid, laid in ruins, and... For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. It, it, it's a good praise, but he's, a, he's still a little messed up here. Um, let, let, me give you, let me give you the fourth thing uh, that, that, that these, these four men did. Number four, they knew that their current situation was part of a bigger story. Right? We, we need to know that. You need to know that the current situation that you are in is part of a bigger story. They did not allow the moment that they were in to pause the mission that they were on. Right? Don't, don't, don't allow that. Your situation is part of a bigger story. It's a part of God's story. He, Hebrews 11, 13, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews is speaking about others um, who were not rescued from their trials. This isn't a promise that, that we're always going to be a res rescued. This, this is a promise that, that God's story will go forward. This is a promise that God will be with you in, in your trials. But the writer of Hebrews says this, those, those all who died in faith, not receiving the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, have acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. They knew that they served a bigger kingdom. They knew that they had bigger purposes than, than just the moment that they were on or in. And, and Daniel, Daniel would go on to later. He, there, there was another king that was about as sharp as this one. He, he threw Daniel in the lion's den. Probably a familiar story to many of you. And then Daniel went on to write this very important book of, of Daniel that is just loaded with, with futuristic events and talking about, about this con coming kingdom uh, that is everlasting. And by faith, here's what Daniel and his friends believed. They believed that one day God would, would not only return them to the promised land, but God even had bigger pictures that that, that God would eventually expand the kingdom to all peoples, to, all, to every tribe, every, every tongue, every nation, that God himself would send the Messiah that would die for our sins so that we could come into this kingdom and experience salvation. And one of the beauties in this is, you know, because we can read and go, hey, they're going to be fine. They're going in the fire. We know that God's going to... They didn't know all this stuff. And, and in fact, Daniel, listen... Towards, towards the end of the book of Daniel, here, here's what Daniel says to God. Daniel 12, begin at verse 8, he says, he says to God, he says, I heard, I heard what you said, God, but I did not understand. In other words, he's writing stuff that he doesn't understand. And he says, he says, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And God answers, and he says, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until... The time of the end. In verse 13, he says, but go your way until the end. He says, and you shall rest. It's a euphemism to saying, hey, Daniel, at some point you're going to die. And he says, and you shall stand. Some translation said, instead of stand says you will rise. In other words, you're going to go to the grave, but you are going to, you are going to rise into your allotted place or into your allotted inheritance. In other words, the story is so much bigger, Daniel. The, st the story is bigger. And I, and I want to ask, I want to close with this question and, and I'll have the worship team come back up. What if we lived as strangers and exiles? What, what, what if we just took, took Jesus seriously? We took the word of God seriously that says, live as strangers and exiles. And, and I think if, if we do that, and when we do that, 
we're declaring to ourselves and we're declaring to a broken world that there is real hope. There is real hope and that real hope is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and, and even when things don't, do not work out our way and we go, man, how, how is this in my favor? How is God with me? We can look out and, and, and recognize that the good deeds that we do, whatever we do in the name of Jesus, for Jesus, by his power, by his strength, that people that do not even know him, that do not love him, will glorify God. And if, and if we want to change the world, if we want to change the world for Christ, we need to live as strangers and exiles. We need to live for a higher kingdom, a better kingdom, an eternal kingdom. Let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that we have the opportunity to, to live as strangers and exiles. But in your kingdom, Lord, we're citizens. We're children. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we, we thank you for that. And so, Father, in this, this broken world, this post-Christian world, a world that doesn't honor you, doesn't glorify you, Lord. May we be the people that you've called us to be. May, may we look at even our own bro brokenness and, and repent from that and, and turn from that. Lord, have, have your way with us. If there's somebody here that hasn't come to the place to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that, that one that enters the fire with us, I pray that today would be the day of salvation that they would call upon Jesus and, and thank him for dying for their sins and their salvation. And Father, for the rest of us, I, I, I pray that we would turn from brokenness, turn to your holiness, to your righteousness, and live as the people you have called us to live as. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. Have your way with us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stories of what they think your life but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never
just tell me your own way right now. You're a good father, Lord. Lord, you've rescued me from the fire. You brought us out. Hallelujah. You're a good, good thankful for a good father. Amen. Let's pray over this. Lord, just thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for bringing us out. Thank you for allowing us to be called children of God. Lord, for you. Lord, I pray that you'd watch over us, protect us as we go from here. Let us spread your love. Let us spread your word to this community. Lord, to all the nations. Lord, thank you for dying for us, for being that sacrifice, and for walking with us along this journey. In your name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Look forward to seeing you back here next week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. <laughs>